Thanks for coming out on a rainy night. But you will you will walk out of here much better educated and probably frustrated. That's the story of any kind of housing in New York. I just want to start off by doing a couple of introductions and welcomes. One, I want to thank Hunter College for providing us the space tonight and for partnering with us. I want to thank President Jennifer Robb, who thought she might be able to drop by, but was not able to, so I'm not sure if we actually have any Hunter representatives, although we've already had their staff and students helping us. I also want to thank um, my two Hunter students, Diana and Jonathan, who are interns in my office and helped with this event tonight. Um, we've handed you, when you showed up, index cards. So if you have questions, and we'll get to a Q&A section, if you write your questions on an index card, and if you need more cards, if you raise your hand, someone from my staff will see you and come and bring you more cards. Um, so we will, when we get to the Q&A section, I'll be reading the questions off. This works really well because if four of you have the exact same question, then we put them together so we know that's a top priority question. And if there's some combination of questions we can do so that we get to more of your concerns, we try to do that also. Uh, I want to um, also let you know that besides our extraordinary presenters, um, and you have the materials and it has a bio on each of them, uh, but we have attorney Lucas Ferrara, partner of Newman and Ferrara, and you will tell when Lucas starts to speak later that he's having a little um, limitations in his voice. And so if you have trouble hearing him, you might have already noticed everything that anyone says into a microphone shows up on the screen behind me up on top. And that's a new technology that allows us to help ensure that people with hearing impairments have access to information at public events. But it actually, in this case, might be valuable, valuable because we have a speaker who, trust me, has a very loud, clear voice in most circumstances, who might have some limitations of his own this evening. We also have attorney Kevin McConnell, partner of Himmelstein McConnell. There's many other names there, but we stopped there. And since his name was second, no one else will be offended tonight. Um, both of these gentlemen I've known for many years and are extraordinary in the housing law universe. We also have attorney Rosemary Cantano. Um, and she's the associate director of the New York Legal Assistance Group's Con Consumer Protection Unit. And so each of them will have interesting, important, and different things to share with us. But I also just want to call up um, one of my colleagues who co-hosted the event with me, and that's Har Assembly Member Harvey Epstein. And Harvey is, I guess, the newest Assembly Member on the east side of Manhattan, but has already um, made his mark coming to Albany. Thank you, Senator Kruger, for hosting this and, and for all of your leadership. As, uh, as you know, both of us have been involved with housing issues for decades and really so important to deal with this topic. Again, my name is Harvey Epstein. I represent the 74th Assembly District. It goes from on the east side down from the Williamsburg Bridge up to north of the UN. Uh, this is something I'm deeply interested in myself as I call up uh, owner myself. It's an issue about how complicated these issues can become. Being on my, I was on my board for almost 10 years. There's a lot of issues that we all need to grapple with. And some part of the responsibilities of the government is really educating shareholders on what their rights are as condo co-op owners and board members, creating information and brief, brief references materials, organizing events like this to make sure you know what's going on, you know, making sure that there are fair elections. I know we've I've dealt with a lot of boards over the years, so there are concerns about fair elections, and sometimes also providing support <coughs> services, mediation, and other services that sometimes happen within buildings. If there are things that come out of these forums, does he need legislative support? I know Senator Kruger and I have been working on ideas for a very long time about how we ensure that co-op and condo owners understand their rights and are really engaged in the process. So I look forward to working with her on this issue and so many others. Thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to speak and I hope you have a really interesting, engaging forum. Thank you all. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you. And so Harvey has been a true partner on housing issues in Albany, so it's really terrific that he has joined the legislature. 
So the order of those people will speak, and I don't think I'm going to introduce them again in between, will be Lucas Ferrara, then Kevin McConnell, then Rosemarie Cantano. And our speakers are welcome to speak either from the microphone sitting down or come up and present from the podium, whichever you're more comfortable with. Okay, Lucas. It's very cool. So I have um, throat polyps. I want to apologize for the for the uh, condition of my throat. I am here against the doctor's orders. So you know uh, I'm a rebellious type. But I'd like to start off uh, with an admission. Uh, my name is Lucas Ferrara, and I'm a co-op owner. Now, for those of you wondering where that comes, it's some from an AA meeting. I'd like all you other fellow co-op owners to admit who you are. It's okay. Don't be ashamed. You're in a friendly audience. What is going on with co-ops? Co-ops has probably been one of the most dysfunctional uh, relationships in my personal life. As I said, I've lived in a co-op for 30 years, which really that can. It was nice. It was shiny. It was new. I called her Sheila. Sorry, I am sexist. She looked good to me. She was new, she was young. <laughs> Everything about Sheila was appealing to me. But over the years, things started to change. Like everything in relationships, Sheila, Sheila started taking me for granted. And then there were her parents. This bored. Why aren't you telling me this? And why aren't you doing that? And why aren't you adhering to this? And who do you think you are? You left the toothpaste cap off. Now, I had a friend who divorced his wife because she forgot to put the toothpaste, okay, put the toothpaste cap back in. She's better off without him. Yeah, she, she, she is. Uh, but it, it's gotten so contentious over the last three decades. Have you not? Much younger than I am, I could see. But the last few years, each of you have been alive. Have you not noticed how contentious the cooperative relationship has become? Yes. And I was doing a little research for tonight's uh, presentation, not anything sophisticated, but I didn't know that 30% of New York City housing is in cooperative form. That is pretty significant. That's a lot of us that need to come out uh, uh, fighting. Because in my personal view, the issues that I wanted to talk quickly about, I know I only have 10 minutes approximately, the things that I want to touch upon briefly is the dysfunction. I think what our friends in Albany can help us do is by re-examining the board process, the board governance procedures, and really tighten them significantly. Um, what, what, what example am I giving you? For example, you buy or you sell your cooperative must go through approval process. Most of the times, you're given a lot of resistance in that process. And most of the times, you're not told why that application has been rejected. That is an extremely frustrating process for many cooperators. And I'm sure you have been or heard of variations on that theme. Now, I think by not requiring the board to give a reason as to why a cooperator or potential purchaser has been rejected is un-American. How does someone fix the problem if they don't know what the problem is? Now, off the record, since we're a relatively small group and since we're friends, I will tell you this non-disclosure loophole is problematic. It has allowed discrimination to fester. Now, I'm not an alarmist, but I will tell you from personal experience, and I'm sure some similar experiences. When I've called and I've said off the record, look, off the record, can you tell me what, uh, why this person was rejected? I have heard things like uh, too young. No, I'm not talking about age. Too young looking. Uh, too old. Too gay. Too straight. It's run the gamut. And that is, of course, all prohibited forms of discrimination. Even discussion like that is not appropriate age, gender, sexual orientation, all religious, all, 
all of that stuff is prohibited, as you know, I'm not about here to lecture. But by not forcing the co-op to disclose, it allows this kind of dysfunction to fester. I can be discriminatory by being silent. That is not fair. And I think we have to bring them out and make them give a reason. Right now, they don't have to give any reason whatsoever. Now, some say, well, if I give a reason, that is going to open this up to the floodgates of litigation, possibly. Then don't use a prohibited basis to deny it. Don't do something that's illegal to deny it. If you want to deny me on the basis of financials, that's fine if you have a standard financial criteria that applies to everyone. But don't deny me because I have kids, or don't deny me because I don't have kids. No, no, no. That will not stand. That should not stand. So one of the things I'm calling for this evening is that boards should be mandated to give a reason for any rejection. And they should be required to do so within a delineated time frame. Right now, they can take their sweet ass time. How is that fair? That is not fair. If you have a purchaser that's waiting 30, 60 days for the package to be approved, how is that fair? That is fundamentally unfair. And there should be limits on how long it takes. Now, of course, the, we can build in exceptions for if someone is sick or someone on vacation. But the board composition is such that if the president's not available, somebody else can step in. You can have designees that can step into the process. But this limitless, timeless ability to sit on applications is dysfunctional. So end the silence. End this unlimited free reign to do what they want. And I think slowly but surely, you can bring the cooperative process back in step, back in parity, back with some sort of fairness, fundamental fairness. Another problem I see in the 30 years that I've been doing this is this bullying from the board. I have had friends who are now former friends. Because once I voted for them to be on the board, there was a personality change. <laughs> Have you noticed that? Oh, yeah. Power. How, and albeit this is such little power, if you think about it, the scheme of things, corrupts. And it certainly corrupts some people in a way that makes them fundamentally dysfunctional, which furthers this process. So I think we need to have some checks and balances. One of the ways you do that is by Senator Kruger. I want you to try to push for your Senate bill, which I think is really well-intentioned, which I'm looking for my notes, which was S30-something, right? Uh, 5839. 5839, the co-op office has been. Which would allow for a mediator to help step in to address disputes. Not only disputes between the co-op and a shareholder, but between shareholders themselves. I can't tell you how many calls I get on a daily basis. I'm sure you do as well, Kevin, where they're saying, too much noise, too much noise. I can't live with this noise, vibration, air conditioning, you name the problem. And they call me and they say, is there anything I can do about it? And there's a lot you can do about it. One of them being that you should keep in mind as cooperators, I know that some of you are content <coughs> owners, but the board management and the responsibilities of the board the technical problems with condos. But as cooperators, as shareholders, you are tenants. Keep that in your mind. You are tenants even though you own a piece of the rock. You have shares in the cooperative corporation. You are tenants with rights. And if you have any question about that, look at the state law called the warranty of habitability. Yes. <laughs> it's good, right? It's good. Yeah. The warranty of habitability makes the owner of the building ultimately responsible for all conditions at the building. So who is the owner of the building? The cooperative corporation. So in theory, the board of directors are responsible for ensuring that your comfort and your safety is not compromised. So if your next door neighbor is making a lot of noise, then the board has the ultimate responsibility to address these issues. Now, all of you know that's not what happens in the real world. And that 
that's where this office, the ombudsman, I can't say it, but this office would come into play. I don't know if you could call them ombudsman anymore, can you? I know, you probably have to. They get to call ombudsman people or person or something like that. I'll have to change that part of it. But another point I'd like to leave you with is this arbitration mechanism. There should be, in my humble opinion, mandatory arbitration for cooperative disputes. Why? Well, while you have rights and the warranty of habitability is one of them, how do you enforce it? Well, if you hire a lawyer, lawyers are not cheap, unfortunately. And many lawyers may not take the case because to, to fund the case from start to finish could cost you tens, if not over $100,000. It's not unheard of for a simple noise dispute to run in the tens of thousands of dollars. And I don't know that you, but many people cannot afford to subsidize that kind of, even people that own substantial cooperatives who could afford $100,000 in legal fees. It's unfair. Uh, so I think that an arbitration process, a mandatory arbitration process, where there would be a venue for your dispute to be heard and addressed, and you would not need, unless you choose to or chose to, be represented by counsel, would be an ideal way to do it. And this is legislation, which you should take a look if you haven't already, is proposing that this office be funded by a $6 a year fee that would each of us as cooperators pay $6 a year. I can't tell you that's the best insurance policy imaginable. I mean, $6 versus hundreds of thousands of dollars. We should support the Assembly's endeavor to get this bill passed because it's important to each and every one of us that owns a corporate. This dysfunction has to stop. And mandatory arbitration, by the way, I think applies in Florida. And I think, according to my research, um, also Pennsylvania. Why not New York? Let's go to a neutral and let's have a neutral decide. Now, 30 years ago when I bought Sheila, I happened to be a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. So our anniversaries coincide. That's why Sheila is near and dear to me. <laughs> for the last 30 years, I've lived in hell, ladies and gentlemen. This lady above me, what does she decide to do? She decides to buy a treadmill. <laughs> and where does she place her treadmill? Directly over my bedroom. Yes. So every night, late at night, okay, late at night, I'm, I don't go to sleep till very late, but she wakes up 5 o'clock in the morning. And I'm here, dump, 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 dump. A couple of years ago, the guy upstairs, a couple of levels above, he's got a problem with his air conditioning. He's got water, literally, so that when he puts his air conditioning, on, and I look out my window, you know what it looks like? It's raining. <laughs> I just have water all over my window. This is not just me, Sheila. I'm really being confessional tonight. <laughs> it's like therapy. This is like therapy. You should charge me. This is free. I'm feeling cathartic. The other night, I'm sorry. I'm almost done. The other night, I get home. I don't smoke. I don't smoke anything. <laughs> but with this book, the last thing you want to do is smoke, right? So I come over and hail. Not good, not good when you have throw box. So I get home. Not that I have personology. Uh, I get home. My house, my apartment, excuse me, smells of smoke. <laughs> so I call the super and I say to the super, oh, what's going on in the apartment? So and so he goes, uh, they can go to the vent in the kitchen because they think that the smoke is going. Up. Well, tell them it's coming down. <laughs> and if I go up, I'm going to sue their ass. Now, what's the point? In each of the both instances, when I sent a lovely young lady a letter, a lawyer's letter, the dumping stopped. When I sent the cooperator a letter about the air conditioning and the flooding, it stopped. When I sent a letter about the smoke, it stopped. How many of you had that luxury? And that's the that's the ugly reality. I was able to make it stop, and it didn't cost me anything. This, this disparity has to end. Either that or all of you go to law school right now. <laughs> so, in conclusion, warranty of habitability, check it out. Let's support this, this proposed legislation about the ombudsman person, and let's see if we can get mandatory arbitration of co-op disputes into play. And let's get the co-op power
our uh, channel in a more constructive way. Let's put limits on their rights to, uh, to issue decisions and, and, and uh, on purchases and sales, and let's hold them accountable for their decisions. <coughs> Let them tell us why we can't get the new people, why they're not doing what they're supposed to do. It's time. It's time for this dysfunction to end. Thank you. Thank you. Corporations. 
and she very proudly talked about how she had pulmonized a 91-year-old woman because she used her walker to get around in her apartment, and that disturbed her neighbors downstairs. So on the one hand, you have you know, the fellow who, who uh, has a fist fight with other shareholders, and on the other hand, you have a 91-year-old person who has to uh, use a walker in order to get around, and the thumping bothers the people downstairs. Now, there's other remedies. And you know, in my experience in, in housing court, I don't think any judge in the world in housing court would have evicted that person. Rather, they would have worked with them and said, okay, fine, let's do this instead. Let's try this instead. But to terminate somebody who's purchased their apartment, who's sunk good money into it, and has lived there as an owner on the basis of a walker, that's absurd. So if you're in the mood to write legislation, Liz, please, let's have something with regard to Pullman and make corporations, call corporations, similar to landlords. If you have a case, present it to a judge, let the judge make the determination, not have the call-off board be the, um, the trier of fact and the prosecutor and then the, uh, the ultimate determiner as to the judgment. Um, Did you have a problem with that going before an arbitrator like I was suggesting? Because you said judge, or you, you prefer that it be judicially heard. Because um, I don't disagree with you. I think there should be a mechanism where board decisions are monitored that, that's disgraceful that senior citizen was evicted. Yeah. Um, I, I think when you go to arbitration, look, as I, you know, this is going to sound self-serving because I'm a lawyer, you give up your right to an appeal. So you're bound basically by the determination of an arbitrator. Whereas if it's a judge, you have the right to appeal that judge's determination to a, a higher court and perhaps even beyond that. So I would be extremely reluctant to have something as basic as the one's right to housing and the right to own be determined by an arbitrator. Um, the other way in which I have found that, that co-ops are, uh, to uh, echo what Lucas said, dysfunctional, is this notion of, um, I call it, you know, building a moat, drawing up the drawbridge, and hunkering down behind the castle. Um, many co-ops are cooperative. They, uh, they, the boards, you know, want to assist their shareholders. They know that they have an obligation to their shareholders. But then there are others in which if a shareholder begins to ask questions, either at the annual meeting or in letters, the board gets extremely defensive and pulls back. Um, in New York, there are significant rights that shareholders have to look at books and records of the corporation. Um, so if you have questions about how the board is being run, and suspicions, and maybe even aspirations to run for the board, you should know that you have the right to a list of the shareholders and their addresses. You have the right to look at the financial books and records of the corporation, or for that matter, the condominium. Um, you have the right to probably look at contracts that the condo or the co-op have entered into. The way you can scrutinize them and see if indeed the money that you're paying on a monthly basis, either by maintenance or common charges, is being spent for a good corporate purpose or a condominium purpose. And if it's not, you can, if, the courts have held that as long as you have a legitimate purpose as a shareholder or a unit owner, you can look and examine the books and records. And a legitimate purpose includes running for the board. A corporation can't say, no, 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 you can't see this stuff because we know you're going to use it against us in the next election. No, that's not a reason to deny access to books and records. So if, and we, and we often have this with folks who come in and see us and they say, you know, my board, been there 20 years now, it's the same people on the board, uh, you know, Lucas has been on the board for 30 years, um, and uh, you know, sometimes, uh, not Lucas of course, but sometimes people <coughs> develop a mentality, as Lucas said, where they protect themselves, dig the moat, pull up the drawbridge, hunker down behind the castle. What do I do to storm the castle? Okay. You've got to organize, you've got to knock on doors, you've got to begin to inquire and ask for the books and records, 
half of the list of the unit owners and shareholders, and begin, what I encourage people to do is find an issue. You know, find an issue. Uh, the building down the block from us is paying 30% less in maintenance, and they have, a, and they have a health club. We're paying more, and we don't have a health club. Why is that? Well, look at the books and records. Demand to see them. You've got the right to see them. Begin to develop an issue such that you can get support from your fellow tenant shareholders or your fellow condominium unit owners. I mean, let's face it, most <coughs> folks come home, turn on HBO, they got heat, they got hot water, they're okay. It's hard to get that person or those people motivated. And the best way to do it is find out what's going on with the corporation or the condominium and use that as an issue to help or to organize and get yourself a voting block so that way you can throw out the rascals and take control of the, of the condominium board or the co-op board. Thank you. Thank you. So brief commercial interruption. We have been joined by Assemblywoman Rebecca C. Wright, and I want to just give her a chance to come up and say a few words. And somebody will come get your card. Hold up your card if it's got questions written on it, and some staff will come around and get it. Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. And thank you all to, to each of you for coming out this evening in the rainy weather and uh, for sponsoring Liz this great forum this evening. It's such an important topic. And I was pleased to be a co-sponsor of the reverse mortgage bill in the assembly. And I encourage you all to write the governor uh, and uh, let him know about your support for that legislation. The governor signed today. I've had three bills that he has signed in the last two weeks. He signed a bill today that I carried for the Office of Court Administration that would update the language for LGBT families in court. And so uh, he's in the signing mood, right, Liz, wouldn't That's you right. say? Um, I want to invite all of you to a Medicare Matters Forum in our community office on 79th Street. We're located right next to the post office on November 13th at 2 p.m. And uh, now back to your distinguished panel here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. And then our next speaker is actually going to focus on issues of reverse mortgages and what that means or potentially means. Um, they are, exist for condominiums now, and we have passed a bill for co-ops that we are waiting for the governor to sign. Yes, I am actually going to give the co-op boards a little bit of a break. We're going to put them over to the side. We're not going to talk about the co-op boards, even though I live in a co-op and it can be challenging. Um, but as they said, the Senate and the Assembly did put forth and passed a bill which would now allow for reverse mortgages for co-ops. It has not been signed by the governor yet, and one thing that I want to say right from the beginning, this is not something that anyone's going to be applying for in the next 60 days. So please, I've had people say, well, I'm going to stop paying my regular mortgage because then I'm just going to get a reverse mortgage. No. Please, if you're paying your mortgage, paying whatever bills, keep running your life the way you are running now until we find out what is going to exactly happen. We don't expect it not to be signed, but you never know. But even once it is, it's going to be a process. So what I want to talk about a little bit right now is what a reverse mortgage is. From, and when this bill was being put together, it was not only lawyers like myself, you know, from the not-for-profit world, but there were also people representing co-op boards, banks, everybody was in the room together. Because the goal is to get something where you, It'll help you to keep your co-op or make your life easier. The banks to make money, right, because that's why they're going to do it. And for the co-op boards, maybe to even be a little bit more secure. But as you might imagine, there's not an exact circle for that, right? Everybody had a little bit of a different idea. So but what I want to talk a little bit about first, real quick, is what a reverse mortgage is, because we really do think that they are going to be pretty similar to what you now can get on a house or a condominium. And if you do own a condominium, you can get a reverse mortgage right now. Right? You don't need this law that your condo is treated just like a house. So if you do have a condo. When I graduated law school back in 93, I graduated thinking that if you got a reverse mortgage, you signed a deed of your house over to the bank. That's the way it seemed in real property law. And that's one of the things that has still that people believe. 
If you take out a reverse mortgage, the first thing I want to tell you, you don't sign your house over. It is a loan. You are taking out a loan on your home. The big thing is you don't make monthly payments. That's what people will say to you. You can borrow money, but you don't have to make a monthly payment. In fact, if there's enough equity in your home, meaning you can borrow enough money to pay off everything and still have left money, they'll actually can even send you a check that could help with things like maintenance and bills and things like this, right? So if you have a house with a lot of equity in it, but you're having trouble making your electric bill or your phone bill, this might be the kind of thing that can help you. You spent your whole life working, putting that money into your home. Now, maybe your home can help help you out a little bit, and you can get, get into that. So, but what happens with a reverse mortgage, just like any other mortgage, is you borrow the money, and it, the thing is, though, no payments are made until the person who owns the, the co-op or the condo and has mortgage passes away. So while you are alive, you have the right to live there. Now, you have to be 62 years old to apply for a reverse mortgage. Um, that is the same in this state law as it is in the federal. We've, everything decided to be even, so you have to be at least 62. Um, you also, in the co-op world, you're you're still going to have to pay your maintenance payments, yes. right? What happens are people always say to me, I do foreclosure prevention. They're like, how do you have reverse mortgage people in foreclosure if they don't have to make mortgage payments? If you own a house or a condo, if you don't make your tax and insurance payments, they can put you into foreclosure. Even though you don't owe any money to Wells Fargo or Chase, <coughs> if you don't pay the New York City Department of Finance, the bank Chase will come in they will pay your taxes, and then they will put you in foreclosure. So that's how a third of my clients are reverse mortgage clients in my foreclosure prevention world. <coughs> in addition, if you move out of the house, a reverse mortgage is for someone who lives there as their primary residence. You can't get a reverse mortgage for your investment property, your summer home, you know, your mother's home, or your daughter's home, anything like that. It's got to be your primary residence. <coughs> if you move out, then that mortgage gets called due. Now, if you get sick and you're in the hospital for a few months or you're in a nursing home for a few months, that's different. But basically, if you're going to be out of the home for more than six, seven, eight, nine months, the bank could come through and say that you're, it's not your primary residence, you don't live there. Okay? When the person who has the reverse mortgage passes away, the house does not directly go back to the bank like a lot of people think. What happens is, your heirs or whoever it is that you leave it to, they have, in the federal world, so we're assuming it's going to be the same here, a year. They have six months, you make an application to HUD, they say yes, you get another six months. You have a year to figure out what you're going to do with the house, right? You can, the person, if they want to keep it, can get their own loan and pay off the reverse mortgage, or they could sell it and pay off the reverse mortgage, but, the, but there's no assuming the mortgage, right? With a regular mortgage, it doesn't happen very much anymore, but Sometimes you'd be able to say, okay, it was my mom's mortgage, so I'm just going to you know, see if the bank will let me take it over. That doesn't happen very often. What a lot of people do, which is not the best idea, is they just keep paying it, and, and all the bank takes your money, but then when something goes wrong, the bank won't talk to you, and then you end up in my foreclosure prevention clinic, so we don't want that. But on the co-op, you notify them of the date of death, and they will find out, even if you do not notify them, that the person has passed away. Um, and then that's when the clock will start ticking. Okay? So with the, now, the other thing is, it used to be in the reverse mortgage world, it didn't matter if you made $10,000 a month or $3 a month. If you wanted a reverse mortgage, you had enough equity in your house, which means that, let's say, I'm going to use really easy numbers here, let's say my house is worth $100,000. <coughs> And let's say the reverse mortgage, because it goes by age. The older you are, the more money they will lend. So let's say I'm 65 and I can borrow 50% of what my house is worth. I can borrow $50,000. Okay? It is not like the mortgages of the old days where I'm going to borrow 97% or 106%. No, you're going to be, there's going to be a limited amount of money that you can borrow. And that's the money that you'll be able to either use it to pay off other debts, if you have a regular mortgage on the property, that regular mortgage has to be paid off by the reverse mortgage. Okay? It's not, this can't be a second mortgage or an add-on or anything. The thing that's going to be a little more complicated with the co-ops is it's going to have to be approved by the co-op board. And the co-op board is not completely out of this. They're, 
Um, so like any other mortgage, it's going to have to follow the rules that your co-op has. So for example, the co-op I live in, you can't borrow more than 75% financing even if the bank is willing to lend it to you. Uh, whether or not your co-op board is going to be amenable to these things, that's going to be because there are no strict rules. That is going to be co-op board by co-op board. So you are going to have to deal with your co-op boards there. Um, we don't know what banks are going to sign on to these. We don't. We're assuming that the interest rates are all going to be about the same. But the truth is that once the governor signs it, that gives a little bit more of a green light. I do know that the lenders have been working on this because they are eager to go. However, as I said before, you know, and as I said, we need to get the governor to sign it and, and get things running. Okay. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all three of you, and we have a huge number of questions, which is not surprising. And I also appreciate um, both Kevin and Lucas's differing opinions about how you approach all this, because there isn't always one right answer. And in fact, that ombudsperson bill, um, Harvey and I co-sponsor it, and we were talking right before about the necessity of going back and revisiting the whole thing now, years later. And I'll be seeking your input, both of you, because basically when we first introduced it, we were told by everyone in the legal world, this is dead on arrival, you'll never get this passed. So I would like to see if we can actually come to agreement um, among differing opinions who, who were actually Hopefully, is isn't the temperature different now than I it was? I think the temperature is different. Um, but as I think probably people even heard from both of you, there are good reasons to take multiple approaches to this. Um, and I too, as I raised my hand before, I too am a co-op um, owner for 30 years also. Congratulations. Thank you. So my husband and I bought the apartment before we got married. And I had a father who was a little concerned you aren't getting married, but you're buying real estate together. <laughs> and I said, Dad, I've been married, I've been divorced. There is no greater commitment than a joint mortgage on real estate. <laughs> this is much more serious than a marriage. <laughs> and the marriage has lasted, and we're still the same co-op. Whatever that means. Um, <laughs> thank you. I will tell my husband that he got a plus for that. Uh, he's definitely the one who helps us stay together. So, because I'm here all the time doing this kind of work. Um, so this is exactly the issue, or one of the issues, that actually Lucas talked about. So what laws exist to protect a shareholder when there is excessive noise from other tenants? In particular, is there recourse if the managing agent refuses to get involved and the board ignores your repeated complaints? And I guess you're not a lawyer who can write a, write a threatening letter on your own. So is there a good recourse model? I need to, because I just want to. Um, and I'm going to say what I have to say about it. Um, one remedy uh, that a co-op owner has, as uh, Lucas pointed out, it is a landlord-tenant relationship. Um, and the law does recognize uh, withholding maintenance, withholding rent, based upon, as Lucas referred to, the warranty of habitability. And in such case, you can withhold rent. And if the board does not take action, or the action it takes is to sue you for non-payment of maintenance, you can defend in court seeking an abatement of part of the maintenance because of the conditions in the apartment. There is one major proviso, though, and that is um, if you have a bank loan, your bank documents provide that if you fail to pay the maintenance, it's a default under your bank loan. Um, so you may find yourself withholding the maintenance for a very good reason based upon the warranty of habitability. But nonetheless, in the middle of a foreclosure battle with your uh, with your lender. But can't you put money in escrow? Uh, you can, and oftentimes people do. I mean, we counsel people, don't even bother putting it in escrow, but make sure you have it. Um, but a bank may not, uh, that might not pass any truck with the bank. They may not particularly care. Okay. Um, I guess it's a variation on the question. So you have a shareholder who is... Um, he's, a, he's an alcoholic, he disturbs all the neighbors when he comes home drunk at night. That sounds like me, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope this has nothing to do with me, because I okay. take 
neighbors. They didn't say you. But I don't know if you recognize any neighbors here, Lucas. Um, and he is very disruptive, knocks on neighbors' walls, curses, disturbs. And the board says they can't do anything. Well, that sounds like a Pullman situation. Sounds like right, a Pullman situation. Which is exactly what Kevin was talking about. Right? Yeah. Pullman eyes. So how do you do a Pullman? How do you do it? How do you, do it? Um, you write a letter. Uh, well, as the shareholders who are affected by this uh, disturbance get together, tell your board, this has got to stop. Um, this isn't just your ordinary 90-year-old uh, lady with the walker. This is somebody who is threatening, uh, is threatening to us. That's and, a nuisance, a common law nuisance, a nuisance. And if anything happens to any of the shareholders, you may be held uh, liable for whatever damages. Right. Um, if, he, if he strikes and hurts somebody, I'm going to sue the call for it. So therefore, what the board can do, and this is probably the better example than, as I said, the lady with the walker, is to write this fellow a letter saying, he did identify him as a fellow, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Saying that you're engaging in the following objectionable conduct, and list as much detail as possible. And if you don't, and if this continues, then we have the right to hold a meeting of the board, if that's what the provisions of the uh, proprietary lease say, and make a determination as to whether you're engaged in objectionable conduct or not. I mean, the second part of the question is compelling the board to do something, and that is the biggest challenge. I've yes. found that. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. is why mm -hmm. I'm calling for some, for some form of an arbitration mechanism to stop this dysfunction which in response to Kevin's uh, objection earlier, where he said he would like some sort of review, well, the assembly people that are here and the state senators that are here can certainly say that any arbitration award or determination would be subject to judicial uh, confirmation. What do you think of that? That's fine. That's fine. Right. <laughs> you just solved the world's problems. <laughs> All right, actually, so this one is one my office gets quite frequently. So you're a shareholder, but other shareholders in your building are using Airbnb or some other online um, product to rent their apartments out without going through any kind of normal channels. What can you do? And it's very similar to our alcoholic uh, abusive fella, and that is, is to get together. Well, number one, it's a violation of the multiple dwelling law. Yeah, call 311. Call 311. It's a cheap. You get the COB and, yeah. and uh, to monitor it. Um, and uh, at that point, when you're violation placed, and if there's violation placed, it's going to affect the co op board, not necessarily the individual who's engaged in the Airbnb. And that'll should prompt the co op board to do something. Yeah, 311 is your friend here. You can do it anonymously, and then I suggest you use that. It's illegal. And I also know the Bar Association's Committee on Co-ops and Condos put out a paper about this. So you could reach out to our office or against the Bar Association and get a copy of that if you want to see what their recommendations are. I mean, Liz, you were at the forefront of limiting the Airbnb. I was trying. I've tried. I've so been, thank you for that. I've been losing that battle for years, but we're trucking along. Oh, so this is also, I've heard this before. Is it appropriate for a co-op's managing agent to receive all the New York State rebates, such as veterans benefits, star benefits, and apply them towards the annual assessments of the building? Um, yeah, it is. Uh, you know, That's we, what we, happens in my yeah, building. Yeah, we've litigated that on behalf of a shareholder and lost. <laughs> so you have some of the finest minds in the co-op world litigating it and losing, so I guess it is appropriate. No limitations currently. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe there should be. Yeah. Okay. Um, our condo board, so we have a condo question as opposed to, our condo board is skipping having the unit owners meetings for nearly two years. They say it's not necessary. The condo as a corporate entity, isn't there any law that mandates annual unit owners meetings? Yeah, I mean, well, one, uh, if you look at the condominium documents, primarily the condo uh, bylaws, which probably provide there have to be annual meetings. I think it may also be in the Condominium Act, uh, the New York State Real Property, Article 9B, that there have to be annual meetings. Um, if they're not happening, then again, the unit owners uh, have to check your bylaws. But most bylaws provide that if 25% of the unit owners, either in number as well as in common interests, uh, petition 
the board for a meeting that the board must hold a meeting. So it's uh, it's not it's against the bylaws. A condominium unit owner has the right to uh, to force the issue and to get the meeting. That sounds dysfunctional. Get out of that yeah. building. <laughs> you know you laugh. A lot of people come with problems. One of the first things I said, you can sell. Why don't you sell? <laughs> All right. Until such time as Liz passes this law that provides some sort of dispute mechanism. Why would you want to make us wealthy? Fair enough. What's the problem? Anyway. <laughs> I purchased my co-op in June and never met anyone on the board. I have no idea who they are. I've asked what the monthly uh, charges are going to, and they've been evasive. How can I find this out? And uh, how would one know when major decisions are being made if your board doesn't have meetings and doesn't share any materials with you? Um, me? Yeah. Okay, thank you. You answer. Um, you know, is um, <coughs> one of the um, mistakes that this person may have made was to have engaged in the wrong lawyer to represent uh, the person in connection with the purchase of the call. Uh, you know, there is something called due diligence that every lawyer should do uh, when they're representing a purchaser, and that, in, that entails reviewing the financial statements of the corporation as well as reviewing the minutes of board meetings. And most boards will allow that to happen. They'll give you the copy of the financial statements, they'll give you the board minutes. Um, this person, having not done that, having purchased, has the right to the minutes, has the right to the financial documents of the of the corporation, um, has the right to know who the uh, officers and the board members are. All of that is, uh, you know, pretty much um, horn book law in uh, dominions. Yes, they didn't request she made to the managing agent, don't you think? I'm sorry? The managing agent, who should the request be made to? Um, probably the managing agent to begin with, but if that doesn't get anywhere, uh, well, you don't know who the board members are, so you're going to have to make it to the managing agent, yes. Well, this is an oldie but goodie. I haven't heard this question in a long time. Does there, is there a term limit on the sponsor controlling the board? Um, if they have just never sold the units. I've been in a building where the owner of unsold shares has run the board for over 20 years. What can be done about that? Um, that to happen all the time, like in the 90s. I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a difficult one, and unfortunately, um, you know, the courts have not been uh, to um, look kindly on it. Basically, the issue is, is the sponsor obliged to sell apartments? Okay. And I've litigated, you know, all I'm talking about losers. I've litigated this one and lost as well. Uh, basically, what our claim was to the court was, you know, the, you get an offering plan. And it says an offer to sell. It doesn't say an offer to rent. It doesn't say an offer not to sell. Therefore, there is an obligation on the part of the sponsor to sell and to sell apartments and to at least make an attempt to. Um, there was a case out of the Bronx in which it looked very close as if the court had basically directed a sponsor to sell. The AG at the time took the position, no, all the sponsor has to disclose, has to do is disclose whether they're going to sell or not, or at least reserve the right not to sell. Uh, it's a tough one. I wish that the AG's office had uh, supported me in, in my argument with the, with the courts. They did not. Um, part of the issue is, is uh, the, some of the courts have said, is it a viable co-op? Is it a viable condominium? And uh, you know, you tell me whether this is viable or not. Um, you know, it's a tough one. So there, right now, there is no absolute uh, obligation on the part of the sponsor who hold their bonds sold shares to sell. And a follow-up question. Somebody didn't realize they were just doing a follow-up question. So once a sponsor does sell the majority of their units, do they lose, relinquish the rights that were put into the original offering plan? These would be their own rights to, um, every offering plan has provision in which the sponsor, holder of unsold units, holder of unsold shares, become super owner. And by super owner, I mean they can sell, they can rent without any board <coughs> approval. Um, certain uh, things that the, even without control, uh, the, the corporation documents or the condominium documents will provide that they have the veto right over certain things. Um, so 
even if a majority is sold, even if a sponsor only has 25% uh, of, the, of, the, of the apartments, they still have the right, to, <coughs> most likely, to sell rent without board approval and may even have some veto. Um, there have been even, even some bylaws which have a provision that says that as long as the sponsor holds 25% of the units, they can appoint one member or two members to the board. Um, courts have held that not only do they have the right to appoint, they also have the right to vote their shares, uh, their units. So you know you can appoint two and use your 25% of the votes to uh, to get your buddy elected. <laughs> All right, I'm going to switch to some reverse mortgage questions. Um, so I believe you answered this, but I'll just ask it again. So if you've already paid off your mortgage, can you take out a reverse mortgage? Yes, and actually, that is actually the best case scenario for getting the new reverse mortgage. One thing that I, I didn't mention, and I now since this opened the door, they are going to look at your financials of how much you make every month. And they are going to look to see if you can afford your maintenance. If the bank feels that you are not in a position where you're not going to be able to make your maintenance every month, let's say your maintenance is $1,000 a month, they will require what is called a set aside, which means let's say you're 70. They usually use, the federal I believe uses 100. So they will say, I need to put 30 month, thirty years of maintenance to the side. So if I'm borrowing $300,000, $100,000 of that might have to be kept in an account to make sure that you pay your maintenance. So, so if you owe a lot of money on your home, if your house is worth $100,000, and you have an $80,000 regular mortgage now, this reverse mortgage is not going to be able to lend you enough money to pay off that other loan. And I will say that I have negotiated a lot of short payoffs in my life. I have had a very hard time getting a regular bank to take a short payoff, even though I have tried on many occasions, in order to just accept the proceeds of a reverse mortgage. They, I actually was told by one bank one time that it would be immoral to let the person stay in their home and not pay back their home mortgage. All right. How do we know what the interest rates are on reverse mortgages? It will be like every loan. The bank will put out rate sheets and whoever it is you're working with. One of the other requirements that you're going to have to do, which they do in the federal, is you're going to have to meet with a counselor. Um, someone who knows about reverse mortgages, who's going to explain things, and you're actually going to have to get a certificate that says that you understood what was going on. Um, but every bank is going to set their rates, hopefully pretty close to what market rates are for regular loans, at least for now. And do we have any advice on which financial institutions um, are likely to offer reverse mortgages on co-ops, or how to decide which is better or worse for condos at this point? I don't. I mean, a lot of the big banks are getting out of lending in New York State. Um, you know, in my practice, we don't see a lot of mortgages still with Bank of America and Chase and all of those. There's a lot of smaller groups coming in. We are hoping that community banks and those will be the people who will do it because we think they'll be the best for the community. But we will see. There were a couple of variations on this question, so I'll try to sort of merge them. So live in a small condo without a lot of money, um, self-managed. If owners are not paying their common fees, sometimes for up to five years, we put liens on them, but nothing's happening. Um, what are we supposed to do? How do we even know how to find a lawyer and why they would be helpful for us? Yeah, well, the purpose of the lien is to uh, allow you to foreclose. And the problem now is foreclosing. It can be a very time consuming and costly process. But that is the mechanism that's available to, to, to the condo to ensure that the lien is repaid. It's a way of forcing the unit owner to step forward and honor the obligations. If not, the unit is then sold at the end of the foreclosure process. And then the proceeds are then to the uh, to the condo, uh, and then any excess, if there is any excess after taxes, and someone who isn't paying their common charges, which are 
usually inconsequential in the scheme of things. They probably aren't paying a lot of other uh, obligations as well. So then it becomes a question of you know how much money there is to divvy up. I mean, have you found that to be the case? Yeah, and part of the problem with condominiums is, is that the condominium um, common charges are behind the bank. In other words, if there is um, a default, such as the, the common charges aren't paid, and the condominium board brings an action against the unit owner, well, there be, and they win and they prevail, whatever they get at a sale will first go to the lender, and then to the condominium association, and then to the condominium unit owner. So a condominium, the condominium is second in line to the bank. Um, it probably speaks of the powers of the financial institution. Um, although there has been a uh, discuss at the New York City Bar Association called the Condo Committee, uh, a bill to provide such that the uh, condominium has certain rights in front of the bank for a certain period of time. I mean, five years is ridiculous. Um, you know, six months is probably enough. So maybe the, maybe the, uh, you know, the legislature will pass and the governor will sign some kind of a bill that will give condominiums some sort of immediate relief rather than waiting behind the, uh, the financial lender. So this is my addendum question. So as you pointed out, if they aren't paying their common fees, they probably aren't paying taxes either. So then government might be taking a lien out as well. And well, government might get in front of you, of even your building for getting payments. But could government just do the foreclosure case so that you don't have to, as a building, go out and spend the money for a lawyer to do it? Sure. Yeah, but, but basically, what my experience has been is that the, um, the city doesn't bring foreclosure actions usually. They usually uh, bundle um, the arrears they sell them into a package and then they sell it. They just Even sell on it. condos? Not actual whole building type things? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that. I made that one up. I just thought, oh, maybe you can sell that part yeah. for you. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll keep digging on that one. Um, can anything be done to allow a tax-free conversion of a co-op to a condominium? I'm not sure what the, what the tax-free part. Yeah. I mean, I know there are buildings that have moved from co-op to condo. Yes. But not that often. Not that often. Um, you have to pay the gain. I, I um, you have to pay the gain on, on the apartment. Got the gain. You've got the transfer taxes. Uh, it could be a significant hit. I represent a, uh, a small building on the um, on the, the Bowery. I don't know if they call it the Bowery anymore. Uh, Soho South, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> in, which, in which it's a co-op, and we considered um, doing something like that because we weren't getting a lot of cooperation from the uh, person who owned the store uh, downstairs. And I investigated it with a uh, tax maven whose name escapes me right now. And the amount of the hit was pretty significant, both in terms of capital gains as well as in transfer taxes. So the, uh, I mean, although my co-op people were willing to do it, we couldn't get the cooperation from the owner of the store. Okay, another reverse mortgage. Can a reverse mortgage ever be used to pay for long-term care services? if I cannot afford to pay for maintenance and other living expenses. So if you're able to take out a reverse mortgage for X dollars, right? So let's let's say you have a home that's free and clear. You don't have any other mortgages that are paid off. If you take out a reverse mortgage and they say the proceeds of that reverse mortgage is $100,000, then you can spend that $100,000 any way you want. You could take it all at the closing and have a check written to you for $100,000. You could arrange to have $2,000 a month mailed to you. If you're talking about long aid, but it would have to be long time care while you were living in the apartment. You can't take out the money and use it to go to a nursing home because then they're going to call it due, which would then force to sell the apartment and pay, and pay back the monies. But once you take out the reverse mortgage, just like any other mortgage, there is no limitations to what you want to do, what you do with the money. You know, I'm not advising this, but if you wanted to take the money out of your co-op and you wanted to, you know, spend fifty thousand dollars on a timeshare, you know, legally you can do that. 
it's your money once you borrow it. You're paying interest on it, and eventually it will get paid back to the bank. But you do, but you can't take out the reverse mortgage and then move to a nursing home if that won't work. Thank you. Okay, so there's a couple of variations, so I'm merging them. So I own my co-op and plan to leave it to my niece or daughter. What are the what are my rights or my niece daughter's rights if the board refuses to give her the apartment saying she has not passed the board or met the financial obligations of the board? So that's question one. Can they refuse that person the right to remain an owner after, let's say, I'm deceased and I get up over my daughter or my niece? Um, I say, Lucas says yes, I say you have to look at your proprietary lease. Um, and, most, and, and most proprietary leases say have a provision uh, transfers uh, upon the death of the shareholder. And most of those read um, if the shareholder dies, then the apartment, then the board will not unreasonably withhold consent to a transfer to a financially responsible member of the decedent's family. Okay? Unreasonably withhold consent to a financially responsible member. Uh, there's a recent Court of Appeals decision, a matter of Del Terzio, in which um, there were a uh, uh, shareholder died, there were two sons, uh, one was a doctor in Pennsylvania, very successful, the other was not a doctor in New York, um, but doctor was a financially responsible person, um, and the Court of Appeals said you have to look to the financial situation of that person in determining whether your consent can be denied and whether it's unreasonable or whether it's reasonable. So it kind of begs the question, what if you, what if your um, person, uh, family member is a drug dealer and they are financially responsible, yeah. but, but a drug dealer. Can I ask a drug dealer. question? Can, sure. So, I, I see this, were they allowed the transfer of the shares, but they were not allowed that Public. person to move in? Right and told them that either you have to sell or, or rent it. Right. That they can. They can you know, I, I think in the Del Terzio decision, it was that, um, I mean, that, that <coughs> allowed people to move in. Um, and the difference is whether you can transfer the shares to an individual or whether it stays within the estate. Okay, and if it stays within the estate, nobody can live there. Um, you can have your relative move in because the ownership is the estate, but the estate can certainly sell it. So, follow-up, is it wiser advice and is it doable that the mother slash aunt would sign something so that the niece slash daughter <coughs> becomes a co-owner during life? So that you're still alive and you're making them a co-owner with you and doing something to establish an additional name on the shares? Um, yeah. Well, you have to be very careful, right? Okay. You know, um, you know um, your daughter uh, or niece might be very lovely, um, but, you know, they end up marrying some, uh, you know, wastrel. Um, and well, you're not really letting them move in until you die. <laughs> you're just making well, them a co-owner. A co-owner, so... Um, the ownership is, uh, you know, Kevin and uh, and Megan, my daughter, and um, and Megan predeceases me, so her heir is James. Who you never liked <laughs> and didn't want to marry. She's not here. And that's right. And so, so all of a sudden, you know, I own the apartment with James. You know. And, but seriously, I mean, it, the, so, so you have to be very careful on okay. that. And if you're going to do any kind of joint ownership and you're not married, you've got to provide for what happens if. You've got to have some kind of an agreement between you and your co-owner. Um, and, you know, you used to see, you used to see that uh, before um, all people had the right to marry. And that is people would purchase together. Um, and one would pass, and then the, the survivor would now have to deal with the relatives of their uh, of their, of their deceased partner. And do 
you need I board can... approval for changing the shares? Yes. You do need yes. board yes. approval. Yes. yes. To change the shares, yes. And if I get, and, and you people are going to, everyone's going to be like, this woman is an alarmist. But this is what I see every day. With the reverse mortgages, do not say, okay, my cousin is 65 and I really need this, so I'm going to put my apartment in their name and I'm going to do it. Um, you know, maybe you have a co op board who won't care. Or, you know, I mean, but please, a lot of people got into trouble in the past because they found a person who qualified age wise and they put their house in that person's name. And guess what? It is now that person's house. <laughs> and if they want to sell it or if you want to do something with it and they say, I need to check for $30,000 or I'm not signing this, you're stuck. So please do not. Another just warning, don't say, oh, this is great, but I'm only 58, I can't get it. But you know, me and my cousin Mary, we've been the best friends forever. It's amazing what happens when money and real estate gets involved. Or she might marry James. She might marry James. <laughs> she might marry James. Okay. Well, I wish she would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is way too cathartic up here. I just saw these tables. And we'll talk about you and your on at another date. Um, I was just coming up with um, hypotheticals, and now we're in marriage counseling. Um, okay, so I know the answer, so I'm just going to say it. Yes, as a shareholder, you have the right to see the books of your co op, you have the right to know how much people are getting paid. Um, that information should not be not refused you, right? And there should be standard right. meetings where information is shared. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So, what if you think your managing agent is really representing the interests of the board president and officers, and not the interests of the overall shareholders? What can you do about that? You know, run for the board. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's unfortunately the only real uh, okay. answer. Yeah. Um, you know, managing. You know, uh, I I sometimes say that the um, it's displaced. The loyalty is displaced because the board is retaining the management agent, so they feel that they're responsible to to the board, not to the individual shareholders. But if the management is not serving your interests, then join together with other uh, shareholders to see if you can have a, another managing agent appointed. Whenever existing management hears that, you usually get a response. In other words, shake it up a bit. Right. right. Uh, if you just are complacent about it, nothing will happen. But it, again, Kevin gave very valuable advice. This is no different uh, running for office, for example. If you want something, you need to work for it, and you need to petition for it. And the way that these petitions are going to be taken seriously, if you have other <coughs> members, other shareholders supporting the idea, it's really a democratic process. And if you want to affect change, what I did, and this is before Al Gore invented the internet, because remember, I've been living with <laughs> Sheila for 30 years. I went door to door and I was leaving notes under people's door saying, uh, I'm having a meeting in my apartment. If you'd like some crumpets and tea, come on down and let's. But, and, <coughs> and by interacting, right, it's a political process. You people get to know you. People say, like Kevin and I, yes, I agree, I don't agree. And then you refine your ideas. And then if people trust you, then you build power. Yeah. Stop being the victim. Right. Build power. No one's going to do it for you. Ask Carmen. Sure. Watch your true. show. You still have the show. show. You still have the show. Watch your show. So the first time I ran for office, I lost by point oh 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 one percent after a six and a half week recount. And then I was with my dear friend's daughter, who had run for student council president <coughs> at the same time, and she won, and I lost. So I was <laughs> saying to her. What's your secret? And she said, brownies. Uh, <laughs> I should have baked them all brownies. That's right. I was like, you're right. I didn't think to do that. There are studies on that, please. They say sugar actually uh, impacts go. the brain. Just so. It puts people so, in a good mood. Get your neighbor's brownies. There you go. Make them again. That's right. Ah, oh, this is an interesting one. Emotional support dogs 
in co-ops with a no dog or pet policy. <coughs> so what are the legal implications of applying to purchase an apartment in a co-op condo with the above policy? If the support dog, is the support dog no longer a pet, does it need to be listed on your purchase application for prospective buyers when you're asked if they have any pets? Well, look, um, I don't know about you, but um, I remember the days when uh, pets used to go into the cargo hold uh, of an aircraft. Now they're allowed to bring the ponies, uh, ostriches, uh, dogs can sit in the coach cabin. Have you ever flown? Have you been flying? Uh, it's a menagerie. Uh, it's the same rules that the airlines are suffering with the same rules that the co-ops are. There's no registration of service animals. There's no special training of service animals. If someone wants their mental health, I'm sure many of you have questioned my mental health. If someone wants their mental health or their physical health on the table and says, I suffer from this, I suffer from that, and I need an animal, and that animal can take any form, really. Uh, and, uh, they can go on, just like the airline, is required to make a reasonable accommodation and allow that animal so there's no registration. And it doesn't matter if they, even if they signed an affidavit when they were interviewed by the board, I swear I don't need a service animal. I will never bring a service animal. Forget about it, it's out. In fact, it just doesn't limit, it's just not limited to animals. Uh, there was a recent case where a cooperator swore that she was not going to have a washer and dryer in her apartment, okay? And the, the, the reason the board didn't want it was quite legitimate, right? Because older buildings, yeah. you start plugging this crap in, it's going to cause flooding, it's going to cause overflows, it causes the hot water all of a sudden to come on if you've had that in the shower. Well, if someone turns on a washer, that may disrupt the entire plumbing system. So they said, you can't have a washer and dryer, sure enough. She says, I promise, I swear I won't have a washer and dryer. Six months later, she's approved, she gets in, she installs a washer and dryer, and then she went to the co-op, screw you, I need the washer and dryer, I'm disabled. So, and the court basically yeah. said, the health division first of all, you can have the washer and dryer. So, unfortunately, I don't mean to make light of disability, I'm disabled myself, okay? Mm -hmm. But this right is getting abused to the point that it's absurdity. When you see a pony on an airplane, no, you see an ostrich on the airplane. The law is being stretched. And where will it stop? Nobody knows. We had represented someone who had a parrot as an emotional support animal uh, because the parrot would say, It's not you, it's your mother. It's not you, it's your mother. That's a joke. Proprietary lease, proprietary lease. Um, many times uh, you got to look at provisions as alterations. Um, some, many of them I've seen have the unreasonable point that the call that the call will not unreasonably withhold consent or unreasonably delay in uh, processing the application. Well, what's unreasonable delay? That's, that's uh, you know, right. that's why God made lawyers, right? Lord, Lord, right. Lord. That's right. There should be time limits. There aren't. There should be time limits. Yeah. There aren't. Okay. Because what's reasonable to you is not. Yeah. Right. It's a problem. It's worth reasonable. Can a co-op board tell you how much you have to sell your apartment for, or put a cap on how low you can go? I think the yeah. courts have held yes. yes. They, they can. They can put a um, a floor mm -hmm. if you can sell below yes. uh, a certain amount. They will deny a purchase if they feel that it is too low, even if you bring the best buyer. If they feel that it's going to bring down the units, because then. And this book has become an issue when we've had people who wanted to sell to a family member for like a lower rate or something of that nature. But they absolutely will say, no, you have to get a minimum of $200,000 for this apartment. And can boards add 
huge assessments to address local law issues and other um, tax issues, I assume, yes. Yes, yes, of course. There's no limit on the amount. No. Yeah, but Dakota had a famous assessment a couple of years now. It's like a, a million dollars per, per share per unit. You see those gargoyles, are very expensive. Very expensive. <laughs> okay. well, if, if you're in that building, you're not in the street, so sorry, I can't help you. That's why when Kenny was uh, talking about due diligence earlier, that is extremely important as part of due diligence, yeah. to check to see the structural condition of the building, whether any repairs or major repairs are contemplated, because yes, you could get some with big dollars. If the original conversion agreement, like within a rental building goes co or condo, allows the original buyers to sell later without board approval, can these be revoked later by the board? You know, you've got um, the one issue having to do with disparity. You know, the, um, uh, the business corporation law, which governs co-ops, uh, provides that shares have to be um, equally, equally uh, treated. Have, and most co-ops have only one class of shares, so those shares have to be treated equally. And there have been some court cases uh, that have held that in those situations where the original purchasers um, had the right to uh, sublet without board approval, that the court should basically uh, uh, reverse that. They said, no, you all have to be treated equally. We all have to uh, give everybody the same rights and the same responsibilities. And can a board determine any kind of charge on you for allowing you to sublet your apartment? You know, the, um, there is a difference, if you will, between what a board can do and what a vote of the shareholders can do. Um, board probably can only impose a reasonable sum, something that's related to the issue of sublet. <coughs> but if the shareholders vote to amend the proprietary lease to say that you know maybe you can charge um, your shareholder X fees or uh, profit share and have you know 75 percent of the profit on the uh, goes back to the uh, call board. That's probably okay, but it would work, but it would have to be a uh, an amendment or a change in the proprietary lease. But is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Yes, you can charge significant dollars subject to these procedures. So the two questions on this, and I suspect the answer is no for me, and I don't think any of you are in this business either. We're having difficult finding um, a quality housing manager for a small affordable building, and we're having difficulty <coughs> finding somebody to do construction issues on our building, and you recommend any number of people. And the answer is no, and my office isn't really allowed to encourage one kind of business to be hired over another. I do suggest you perhaps look at the Co-op Condo Association, yes. um, reach out to them. They may have recommendations, and I know they do a newsletter or a news magazine where they have advertisers. Yes, the and cooperator. Quite a few of them, the cooperator, are for smaller buildings. Yes. Um, so you might check there. I don't know if there's anybody else who sort of makes recommendations. I know I live on a city block that every building's almost identical. They're all small, six-unit co-ops. And we all just talk to each other and say, you know, anybody find somebody good to do this or that? <coughs> so we just sort of do word of mouth. Um, but I don't know, other than the Co-op Condo Association, I'm not really sure that there's anyone who would be in the business of knowing that. Sorry. I think it's called the New York City Council on Cooperatives. That's what it is. Right. Thank you. Marianne Rothman. Marianne Rothman, yes. Director. And she is sort of a know a little bit about everything person. Um, yes. Okay, if a, if a condo management company agent signs a legal document without a proper authorization or power of attorney of the board, what is the board's recourse? Fire them. Yes. <laughs> number okay. one. Um, number two, are they bound by that contract? That's it's outside the scope of the authority. That's a very, that's a very complicated. Yeah. There are different kinds of authority that's rec recognized by the law, and one of them is apparent authority. It's called apparent. Yes. And if the individual acted on behalf of the board, whether it's a co-op or a condo, and led others to believe, and the condo never did anything about it or never 
stopped anyone from believing that this individual was acting on their behalf, then the building may be bound by this contract, um, even if they didn't directly participate yeah. in its negotiation. It's a very dangerous thing. It has happened. Um, that's why you have to have trust in those that you work with with these buildings. Because why should a third party suffer from or dysfunction, a third party providing services, believing that this individual represented your interest. So he painted, he provided whatever supplies he needed to supply. And then when it was time to pay, the building saying, you are not authorized. It's, it's a catch-22. Okay, let's see, this is a whole series of questions. I'm one card. Do you have any um, are, are subleases allowed in co-ops? And the answer is that depends on your individual co-op and what their rules are. Proprietary lease. Proprietary lease. Oh, I don't know what this means. Are there quick claim deeds for co-ops? No. 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 Okay. No. So I still don't know what one is, but because no. <laughs> remember, you're a tenant. I started off by saying earlier that if you live in a co-op, you get shares of stock, and you are given a lease. Where's the deed in that analysis? You only have shares of stock. <laughs> Should voting results of elections of board members be posted? Um, I mean, in the call boards, I don't know how they're doing that. The, the, um, what, my, what I advise my call boards to do is uh, post the winners, but don't necessarily post the results. Um, that could be um, embarrassing. Uh, by the results, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jack got uh, 100 votes and, uh, and Mary. James got 20. <laughs> Can a board replace a board member without an election? Yes. Look at your bylaws. You gotta look at your, your bylaws. Your bylaws. Yes. And who is responsible for repairs? The management company or the co-op? Well, ultimately, the co-op is responsible. The management will usually but the building, as I said earlier, you are a tenant. The cooperative corporation is the landlord. The landlord is responsible for repairs. It, since it's a cooperative, can designate a managing agent to do that work. And if it doesn't, then it's a violation of that state law that we were discussing earlier. And as Kevin said, you have some rights and remedies, which would be including, which would include withholding maintenance, but I don't like it because of the blacklisting things that can happen and how it could eventually impact your credit rating and all, all that other bad stuff. Withholding maintenance is not the ideal thing. There's an alternative, however, if one is looking for repairs, either a condo unit owner or a co-op shareholder, and it's called what's called an HP action, which uh, and HP stands for housing part. You can go to civil court. File it yourself. Yes, right. It's a special part that your tenant complaints, particularly about violations. Yes. This one's interesting. I never heard this one. I've recently discovered that my condo building has placed hidden microphones oh my at the front the desk, building. at the front desk, and at the gym. Apparently I place the those microphones. <laughs> <laughs> no cameras, though. No cameras. Uh, the board is apparently supportive of these. How do I deal with the situation? I know about the hidden camera issues for a lot of different storylines, but what do you get from hiding microphones at the gym? A lot of grunts. grunting. Yeah, no, really. I don't even know what the board would want. I mean, uh, Tape recording. There better, let me just say, there better be a legitimate reason for these microphones. Is there a one side is recording? If construed as uh, somehow by New York State law, as long as one party knows there's a recording going on, Oh, they okay. can do it, though. If, if there's a violation of privacy rights, mm -hmm. that's where it gets really dangerous. So the one place you should never put a camera is a toilet. Um, that's clear. You shouldn't put a camera in front of someone's door, directing at someone's door. You can't put it inside somebody's apartment without their consent. Now, there's some of you that may want a camera inside your apartment, but you have to consent to it. I 
was being facetious. But there are some exhibitionists I'm sure. No. No. Okay. That's interesting. It's juicy. Um, sorry. So the answer is no. You shouldn't do it. it. It does trigger liability. In fact, a lot of privacy violation cases have been popping up against employers, too, by the way. For some reason, some employers have put cameras in microphones in very weird places, and they're suffering for it. Mm -hmm. It's not advisable to do that. Okay. I particularly like where they say you, uh, you are being filmed. That's the best idea of doing you want. It, the whole purpose is security, mm -hmm. right? They always tell you that's the reason for these cameras, is to protect and to secure the premises against intruders then why not make it open and obvious? Why are you hiding things? Something strange. So, my management agent added a, an abatement and start credit charge to my maintenance invoice. Apparently they said they miscalculated my credit in a previous payment. I checked with the Department of Finance and was told no charges should be applied to my bill. There wasn't, <coughs> that I was entitled to these. Do I have to pay? I believe the management company is the one making the mistakes. You might address the assessment issue. That happens a lot. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, see, I'm not sure of the question. I mean, oftentimes what uh, co-ops will do is is that they will smash, uh, pass a special assessment. That's how it's done. In the uh, to equal the amount of the co-op tax abatement, right? Um, in order to get the co-op tax abatement, however, you must maintain the apartment as your primary residence. So if you do not maintain as your primary residence, then you won't get the tax abatement, but yet nonetheless you'll have to pay the assessment. But, uh, but the, they made, uh, this but person it. argues the management <coughs> agent made a mistake, and it's still their mistake, and so why should I have to give back this money <coughs> I got correctly from them in the first place? <coughs> Probably shouldn't. So the agent said, we gave you this abatement, but you're not actually eligible for it. So the person checked with the Department of Finance who said, yes, we did award the abatement under whatever one it was, because it doesn't say in your name. Uh, well, I guess they did say it was star credit. So if the government actually did give you the abatement and the managing agent made a mistake when they said you weren't eligible for it, pay it back, you shouldn't have to pay it back. You shouldn't have to pay it back. Right, there's right. something going on there that does not make something, sense. Right. Something doesn't sound something right. Doesn't I would push back on that personally. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There are more cards than there are hours. Um, these are great questions. I'm going to tell you I've gotten through about half the cards. We're not going to get through all the cards, so I'm trying to make sure, <coughs> one, that I can actually read your handwriting. I apologize to some people. And two, that we didn't sort of already um, cover things. Oh, how do you find a pro bono housing lawyer? <laughs> you know, well, if you're income eligible, income eligible yes. um, there are legal service offices and other organizations that provide pro bono legal assistance, including New York Legal Assistance Group. But if you're a condo co-op owner, it, not that many of you may be eligible yes. for the pro bono legal services. Is that a fair statement? That is true. Though I, mean, I would say you can call the Bar Association, and sometimes what you can ask for is what's called a low bono attorney, which means it's someone who will charge less than you know two, three, or four. I will say it is very difficult to find someone um, that's going to take on a co-op case uh, for a very reasonable amount of, of money. There are two professions in which the time is their stock and trade. One is a lawyer. Although the, system, I will mention the other one. although the system is pretty um, uh, pro safe, right? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, but you don't need a lawyer in theory. It's advisable that you do have one, though. But in theory, you don't. Need now, one. if you do end up in a co-op a foreclosure case, either with your co-op over maintenance or with your bank, that there are legal services like NILAG and Legal Aid and Bronx Legal Services, and we take all those cases free of charge. So if you're having issues with your mortgage or your co-op board is suing you because <coughs> they say there's an issue with the rears and all of that, those you can get free legal services for in the Supreme Court. Yeah. Is in, in an arbitration situation, and Lucas, you were pitching that before, who would pay? And who would 
actually not seeking arbitration technically. The fees are not that terrible, but the person seeking the arbitration usually uh, pays that fee. But I'm proposing that we come up with some system, and Liz's system with the ombudsman office is a six dollar a year charge. We, in theory, I guess you would just contact the. How would it work, Liz? You would just contact that office. Yes, that's how. It and then the fees would be paid by your tax dollars. Uh -huh. So let's push Liz to push this through. <laughs> I'll need everybody's help, but thank you. Okay, where can I finally be privy to the assessment and taxes that a developer pays for the property that his building will be constructed on, uh, whether it's city, state, or district? Uh, let me read the rest of it because I'm not totally sure if it's all one question. So as the owner of an international business for 35 years, I'm acquainted with established value and costs. It should not be rocket science, nor should it be withheld. I want this information. So you want to know what taxes and assessments are applied to the underlying building uh, that's being constructed, I guess, because there's going to be a co-op conduit. Um, the New York City Department of Finance has, uh, has a website in which if you ascertain the block and lot for the, um, for the site, you can access that and, and get uh, what the property is paying in real, in real estate taxes. Yeah. And that only shows up after they've actually built the building and start right. to pay. Right. And most assessments and <coughs> tax abatements also some get triggered during building, but most are triggered after the building is up. Because that's what the city that's when the city sends out an assessor to make a determination of what the assessed value is, and therefore the taxes are based upon what the assessed valuation is, which isn't necessarily market value either. And I suppose if you were buying into a brand new building, the there's a prospectus that has to be filed with the attorney general's office. Much, much of that would be in the offering plan. And that would be in the offering plan. So if you're buying into a brand new building, a lot of that should be there at least as base, right? Yeah, but those are only estimates. Right. Okay? Right. And what we've seen is people have bought, based upon what the offering plan said, would be the real estate <laughs> taxes. And then after the city comes in with this assessment, the real estate taxes are higher. Um, and, you know, and you, you know, you'd have to prove, if you wanted to bring any kind of a cause of action, that there was some kind of fraud going on, um, or maybe the person who uh, estimated what the taxes were committed some kind of malpractice in making that determination. Oh, good luck with that. Yeah, good luck with that. It, that it's not an easy one. <coughs> Do we know what the position of the governor is on our reverse mortgage co-op bill? We haven't heard that he was against it, so we're going to, I think that there's been enough need for it and call for it, um, that, I, I mean, I'm one person, but I would be shocked if it didn't get signed, but you never know. And you can call into his office mm -hmm. or write him letters, or even just, you know, a postcard, please pass the bill for reverse mortgages for co-ops. Um, okay. There's never, nothing wrong with lobbying him yeah. for it. And I know that the legal services organizations and places like the Empire Justice Center have sent him just recently reminders that, can you put this one towards the top? When is the uh, website you can email? Well, there's a governor's, well, that's right, there's a governor's website, there's phone numbers up in Albany, and his New York City office. And if you want to write him, it's just the governor, the capital, Albany, New York, 12247. But the post office could find it even if you didn't know the zip code. Uh, the governor, the capital, Albany, New York. Um, would you have any guidance? Oh, no, we did that one already. Sorry. Is it wiser or a good idea to change your lawyer if you feel the lawyer is not doing a good job or taking too long on your case? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to ask the lawyers. You don't like your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Are you about me again? Even if you're just not comfortable with your lawyer, I mean, the lawyer works for you. You have to have a certain comfort level with your attorney. Yeah, if you don't like the explanation, switch. Right. Good. If you're not happy with the service, switch. It's not a marriage. It's not like being in a co-op like Sheila. <laughs> divorce, file for divorce. 
I get fired and I work for free. <laughs> so, you know, it, you, you got to have that certain comfort level. Yeah. Can co-ops allow seniors to rent out their apartments indefinitely? Again, I think that's the bylaws of any yeah. given building. Right. There's no special exception for seniors. You can't change that uh, without sharing with the other You know, I mean, the, I mean, the answer to the question is, um, you know, the board could give it and the board could take it away. Um, you know, they can, as long as they are consistent with what the proprietary lease says. And if proprietary lease says you can withhold consent to a sublet for any reason or no reason. You can sublet forever and ever to whomever. And anybody can, not necessarily a senior. I mean, then, then you have the right to do that then. Yeah, but, it, but it can't be for less than 30 days, see, see, right. Right. see now there are new laws that are saying it, it can't be for Airbnb purposes, for example. Right. So yes, well, I mean, it depends on what the proprietary lease says. A lot of proprietary leases said you need two-thirds of the shareholders to vote. Change. Good luck. There are a lot of co-ops with really bad bylaws and even bad proprietary sure. yeah. I mean, that really give no guidance. They really give us the board a really wide discretion. Right. Unfortunately. And in fact, if anyone here is on a co-op board and you're realizing our proprietary leases are lousy or our bylaws are lousy, you can actually get a template of a more modern bylaws from the association of cooperatives and condos, and you can take a look at it, make amendments to that you that you think makes sense for your building, and you can vote in a new set of bylaws. Um, I know in my small five-unit co-op, we took a look at our bylaws and we're like, these are terrible. And they're like hand-scribbled from the 70s, and no one can even figure out what it's saying anymore. And so we went and got a copy of the sort of new standardized 21st century model. And we went through that and we made a few addendum for ourselves as a building. And we um, voted, now we have a co-op board which is all members. So all five tenants are the board. And we try to do everything by group agreement. And that's worked for us, not on um, So we just, we just passed new ones, but all of us agreed to it. Um, and that's actually been very helpful because now when a question comes up, you can actually go to a typed online version of your bylaws and proprietary lease and know what the hell your rules are. So, I don't know if you can get it online. We put it online once we wrote it for us, once we amended it for ourselves, but I think you can download it. I think they might charge you something from the co cooperators group, but you can, you can buy one. I'm assuming you can buy Okay, what can be done if there is smoke from another apartment? Right, okay. Did you have a smoke issue? Yes, you did have a smoke issue. Well, one thing I know, your building can decide to be a smoke-free building. Correct. Right, so that is something that your board can decide that they're going to be an indoor smoke-free building. Does that include the apartments as well? Where you live Good. Good. Mine's a smoke-free building. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. while you're fighting it on a very practical, because I had this problem where every time I went to the ladies' room in my apartment, the smoke, they sell these <laughs> magnetic things that you can put right over the vent. What a difference. It really, it really worked. It was like $20. Wow. So while you're fighting it to make your life a little better, you might want to look into something like that. What if it's coming through the window? Yeah. And you don't know where it's coming from exactly. Yeah. Well, now we have the problem in our co-op that people are smoking marijuana. <coughs> right, right? Oh, you walk down the hallway. Oh, yeah. So, no. All right, so I'm the sponsor of the marijuana belt. 
So that can be another forum for another night. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I will point out, right now, because marijuana is not legal, mm -hmm. if somebody's smoking in your building, there's not really a law saying they can't, because the law is that you're not supposed to be using marijuana, and nobody's going to come knock on everyone's door and arrest 40% of the people in the building. But in my law, if it passes, it requires the same smoke-free standards as we have for tobacco, so your building would be able to pass um, a, a rule or policy, no marijuana smoking in this building. What about medical marijuana? They could also apply that. You could have to make that decision. Most medical marijuana is not smoked because most doctors point out whatever your illness is, inhaling burning products into your lungs is probably not the best answer. So there are many ways to use medical marijuana. Um, and, and in fact, the, the flower and smoking the flower is actually not legal under medical marijuana. Okay, back to housing. Although, it was nice to have a sidebar into legal marijuana. I spent many nights of my life presenting on legalized marijuana. Um, New York property taxes are just way too high. Co-op condo property taxes are too high. Well, the truth is, sometimes co-op condo taxes are much less than the taxes paid by renters. And one, two, and three family households in New York City pay less than co-op condo or renters. And so there is a, and everybody thinks that property taxes are too high, and they're probably right, but we're probably not getting rid of the system. But two things are happening. There is a commission the city has created that is supposed to be making their recommendations by the end of the year on how to change the New York City property tax system and hopefully make it more fair and equitable um, and also come up with a system of assessments that actually can be understood by one human being. I'll take one human being could understand it and that would be a win. There's also a lawsuit moving through the courts. I think, Lucas, you're involved with it. Uh, I was involved in the first one. The, sec the second one that's now making its way um, actually has some legs. Uh, it appears that this, the current city tax bill um, or law, believe it or not, desperately impacts minority communities. Believe it or not, minority communities are paying more than their fair share. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was found to be the case by a lower court judge. It is now at the appellate division. John Levin's case is before the appellate division. So we don't know, the argument was just had on that, whether the appellate division, which is our intermediate appellate court, is going to find that the city tax law is unconstitutional because of the uh, disparate discriminatory impact. There are problems with the tax system, no question about it. But um, expect taxes to go up higher because uh, I don't know about you, but uh, all these services have to come from somewhere. Uh, landlords getting killed under the new tax law. I think valuations have gone down by about 30%. Uh, as a result of the new tax, the new rent laws that passed in June. So if the property value is going down by 30%, tax revenue is going to go down. So where is all this money for cops? Where are the hundreds of millions of dollars for cops going to come from? So I think we're all going to get hit big. So if you think your taxes are high now, wait till this law gets through the courts. Yeah, it's extremely complicated, and there's lots and lots of storylines that I don't. We could have many forums on that. And it's 8 o'clock, so I'm going to close with this last interesting one. Many that I didn't get to are also interesting, I apologize. There were just, each of you probably put in two questions each based on the number of cards, which is great. So I never thought this would happen until recently when I saw it happening. Is there any minimum vote of shareholders required for a co-op corporation to sell the entire building and if it is sold, is the lease automatically terminated? Um, you know, again, I, I go back to the bylaws and the proprietary lease. Um, there's probably a provision in the bylaws that says that all the leases can be terminated. My recollection is, is that most of them say it has to be a vote of 80%. It's a high percentage. Not, not a majority, and not two-thirds, but 80% of the shareholders 
maybe by number as well as by shares, have to vote to terminate. This was a newspaper story about a building in my district on Park mm -hmm. Avenue where the entire building was um, going to be sold. So <laughs> it came in and offered a huge amount of money for an entire co-op. The so problem with this and what yeah. is not tested, and I'd be curious what Kevin has today, but this is going to... There are some cases that suggest when a, a, a multi-unit residential structure loses its cooperative status for whatever reason. By the way, co-ops have gone into foreclosure. Sure. What happens if a co-op goes into foreclosure? Believe it or not, the occupants actually may be entitled to some form of rent stabilization. So in this scenario, if someone doesn't approve the 10%, the 20%, that do not vote in, in favor, in theory, they may become rent stabilized tenants. So the, the developer is <laughs> tearing down the building and putting a giant building, new building up. Yeah, is going to be left with 20% of stabilized tenants. Now, the problem with voting against this is that you lose whatever equity you had. Plus, the tax hit could be significant. It's a so capital gain. It's yeah. uh, untested, is what I'm trying to tell you. But ultimately, I think, and I wonder if Kevin agrees, if the building loses you, its cooperative status and you decide that you want to stay, you may be rent stabilized. Well, that, yeah. I mean, there is a court of appeals, court of appeals decision, um, <clears throat> federal home loan mortgage. That's um, that's the case. In which um, that what happened was is that the building was foreclosed on, and the question that became is what becomes of the status of the cooperators, the people who are the cooperators. And the court held it, they became rent stabilized tenants. So if um, you ask the, the question the, part of the part of the problem part of the issue was because we had a situation in which we were asked for advice where people were in a leasehold co op. And the leasehold co op means that the co op doesn't own the building, um, doesn't own the land, it leases from somebody else. And if the leasehold rent goes up so high that the co-op can't pay it, what becomes of the co-op shareholders? They became unstabilized tenants. <clears throat> At that point in time, our advice was is that they may not be regulated because they're in, the rent may be over the threshold um, to make it uh, high rent deregulation. But now, based upon the law that was passed on June 14th, there's no such thing as a high rent deregulation. So all those folks would become rent-stabilized tenants. And don't ask us what the rent would be, because we probably would revert back to the last registered rent, so you could end up being paying nothing. And Kushner, who tried to buy that building, gets to the stuff. So whoever asked that question, if that's really a storyline where you live, you want to get really good legal counsel. And if anybody tells you they've got a great deal on a co-op in a building that's land lease, one, get really good legal counsel, and probably two, run the other way, is from my experience. I want to profusely thank Lucas, Lucas Ferrara, Kevin McConnell, and Rosemary Cantano for being here tonight. And for